So this is reproductive uh, behavior in pterosaurs, Mesozoic flying reptiles. Um, this is how much we knew about reproductive behavior in pterosaurs prior to 2004. Happily since then there have been a whole series of finds, these are a couple of them, which have provided us with some really important insights into the reproductive uh, modes of pterosaurs, but we're dealing with pterosaurs, so inevitably there's been lots of controversy, there's been confusion, attempts to kind of depict what people believe to be going on often contain all sorts of errors and misconceptions and much of what you see here is basically wrong, in particular this one which I'll, if I have time I'll come back to at the end. So the question might be what do we really know about pterosaur reproductive biology and the first step really is to sort of have a look very quickly at what the fossil evidence is for this particular behaviour. Um, this includes Mrs. T, an example of Darwinopterus, which is a pigeon-sized pterosaur from the Jurassic of China. An important thing here, this is a female associated with an egg, which is extremely useful in terms of understanding key aspects of reproductive biology. We also have two beautifully preserved embryos and eggs from the Yixian formation of Liaoning, China. These are probably Anithokyrid pterosaurs. We have this absolutely extraordinary find published a couple of weeks ago in Science, which is an accumulation of more than 300 eggs, pterosaur eggs, amongst which there are some absolutely uh, beautifully preserved examples, 3D examples, and around about 16 embryos. So again, this is, is telling and will continue to tell us lots of very interesting things about pterosaur reproduction. Finally, we also have a beautifully preserved embryo in remains of an egg of Pterodostro, the filter-feeding pterosaur from the Lower Cretaceous of Argentina. If we put together all the records we have of eggs and embryos, hatchlings and early juveniles shown in red here, calibrated against a phylogeny, we have a modest pterosaur fossil record of early growth stages, but one that's really, really useful in terms of understanding what's going on. And I've just shown on the left-hand side here various hatchling individuals and an egg there as well. Um, so what I want to do in this uh, very brief talk, as it turns out, is look at five aspects of pterosaur reproductive biology. Don't worry about reading all these because we're going to go through each one in turn. The context for this is phylogenetically is a group called Sauropsida, and Sauropsida basically is what you might call traditionally reptiles, which is this lot here, and birds. And the important thing here is that all these groups shown in bold have extant representatives where we have some understanding, sometimes not so great, of their reproductive modes, what they actually do. So these provide a really important context for understanding pterosaurs, but also they help us to understand what's going on there as well. So most sauropsids, you've just seen them, actually have paired ovaries. The one exception are birds, uh, highly derived sauropsids which have a single ovary. Mrs. T seemed to suggest with her single egg that pterosaurs also may have only had a single ovary, which would have been an interesting example of convergence, except that when the counter slab was reported a couple of years back, we found not only uh, the reverse of the original egg, but there's a second egg preserved in the body. I've had a look at it and I can completely confirm this. So paired ovaries in Darwinopterus seems extremely likely and because reproductive systems generally are very conservative I think it's highly likely that paired ovaries were probably the norm for pterosaurs. The relative size of the egg compared to the mother tells you something about how much parental investment there is in that particular group. Basal sauropterids tend to have relatively small eggs, relatively small investment, derived sauropterids, i.e. birds, have relatively large eggs, quite a large investment. Mrs. T is very helpful here again because we have an example with eggs preserved with the adult. There are several ways of calculating the mass of Mrs. T. 
and it's a relatively straightforward exercise to calculate the original mass of the egg. You just use this expression here and hey presto it turns out six grams. So the context then is this. Here we see initial egg mass, so that's the egg when it was first laid, and here's the female mass, and this is for a large number of species of sauropsids. And you can see quite clearly birds have relatively large eggs, whereas reptiles, that group down here, have relatively small eggs. Where does Mrs. T fit? Well, she comes about there. Pterodostro comes in around about here. They have quite large ticks on here because our estimates of the mass of adults is, uh, show quite a lot of variation. Hamipterus, that egg accumulation just been looking at, comes in somewhere about here, but I haven't finished sort of sorting that one out yet. But there are two main conclusions we can draw. First of all, pterosaurs seem to have relatively small eggs. And secondly, insofar as you can draw any conclusion from three points on a graph, yes, of course you can, Richard. Um, the allometric slope seems to be more comparable to that of things like crocs and turtles than it does to birds. How significant is that? We will see in the future. How big was the clutch in pterosaurs? Well, this extraordinary accumulation from Hami in Xinjiang um, provides us some clues. It doesn't provide us with a, a concrete number because so far we don't actually have any nests, i.e. egg accumulations themselves, but it's very hard to imagine this accumulation forming from literally hundreds of nests in which there are just one or two eggs. I think this accumulation rather says nests have 5, 10, 15 eggs in there, maybe more. I'm confident at some point we will find nests in this deposit. The nature of the eggshell tells you very important things about the incubation environment and how that particular group incubates their eggs. Pterosaurs lay parchment shelled eggs. We see that beautifully in the Xinjiang material. Here's that crumpled and folded up parchment shelled egg of Hamipterus. It's identical to what you see in lizards and snakes when their parchment shelled eggs dry out. There is a very thin, literally paper thin, 60 micron thick calcareous layer uh, that uh, is found in Hamipterus. It's also present in Pterodostro. You see that how incredibly thin it is here in this break here. But that layer is entirely absent, for example, in the Yishiyanonithokyrids and also in the Darwinopteris eggs as well. How do these eggs then compare with known eggshell types? Well, they're completely unlike the rigid shells that you find in birds or in crocodilians. For one thing, the shell's much, much thinner. They're a bit more similar to turtles, but here also the eggshell is quite well organised in terms of those crystalline units and is relatively thick compared to pterosaurs. Pterosaurs compare almost, uh, almost identical in many respects with the parchment shells of lepidosaurs, including these things like the Tuatara sphenodon, which also often have this very thin sort of calcitic layer over the top of the shell. What does this tell us about the nesting environment? It's very difficult to sit upon a parchment shelled egg. It means almost certain that they've incubated either in vegetation or soil or sediment, quite possibly the sediment that you see that forms the deposit in Hami and Xinjiang. If that's correct, and it's very, very likely, one reason being that parchment shelled eggs dry out very, very easily, then that tells us that these eggs developed with their embryos at ambient temperatures, which means they probably develop quite slowly. Fifth aspect, if we look at sauropsids as a whole, they show a very wide range of behaviours and abilities when they hatch out. So on the one hand, we have hatchlings of lizards and snakes and crocs, which are highly precocial. Essentially, they're like small versions of the adults, except they can't reproduce and they don't need uh, any kind of parental care. On the other hand, if we go and look at some of the birds, particularly large birds, large seabirds, they, are, they require lots of parental care and they're highly altricial. How do we figure out whether pterosaurs were precocial or not? 
Um, in this case, we've chosen to focus on the flight ability, and I'll start by looking at ossification patterns. The embryos and hatchlings of pterosaurs are remarkably well ossified, far more so than the hatchlings of things like the starling, and much more like the hatchlings of extremely precocial birds like the button quail. And noticeably in pterosaurs, you already have this highly elongate forelimb is well formed, unlike that of birds. Wing membranes are present in lots of hatching individuals. There's wing membranes preserved all over here in this specimen from the Yushiam formation. And if we look closely, it even has critical structures such as the actin of fibrilli, the organization, the fine detail of is, is exactly as in adults. So they certainly have the uh, equipment to be able to fly when they were hatchlings. Could they actually do it? It's a relatively straightforward task to produce reconstructions of the skeleton and the outline of the wing membranes and to calculate very simple sort of aerodynamic uh, uh, features of these animals exactly as we would do for adult pterosaurs and in this case what we find if you plot wingspan here along the bottom against wing loading this embryo bear in mind it's an embryo actually plots out in terms of wing loading together with the adults so there's strong evidence here that this individual, even though it's still inside the egg, had, had, had the ability at least to fly. And this is in very sharp contrast to hatchling birds or baby bats. If you do the same thing, you find that they're, generally speaking, their flight ability is zero, with the exception of megapodes. Ask me about those later. So what we can do in terms of wrapping up this exploration of the evidence for superprecocial flight ability in pterosaurs is have a look at five different quite criteria here ossification morphology wing membranes aerodynamic ability and taphonomy i've not spoken about all those we've got 14 different pterosaurs in which we have embryos or hatchlings to look at and when we do this we find that in 60 out of 70 of these cells the answer is yes that's consistent with a flight ability so in this particular case i'm totally convinced that hatchling pterosaurs were able to fly. They certainly could fly if they want to. One corollary of that is it probably means they didn't need to have parental care. That doesn't mean to say they didn't get parental care. They might have still got it whether they wanted it or not, but it doesn't mean that they required it. So what does this tell us overall about pterosaur reproductive biology? They almost certainly had paired ovaries, they had relatively small eggs, which suggests, relatively speaking, a low parental investment. Clutch size was certainly, we think, greater than one or two, but exactly how many we don't know. Hopefully there'll be data on this in the near future. They have parchment eggshells, which suggests incubation by burial, which suggests development at ambient temperatures and relatively slow development of embryos. We have a super precocial flight ability, which is at least consistent with little or no parental care. We'll probably never know for sure, although who knows, trackways, you never know what you're going to find there. If we put all this together, what it tells us is that pterosaurs basically retain that basal sauropterid, or what you might call reptilian mode of reproductive biology. But to put it back in here, what it means is <clears throat> All the features that we see or that we can deduce about pterosaur reproductive biology are consistent with these kinds of extant taxa, in particular lipidosaurs. They don't actually share any of the derived features that are found in birds, which is interesting because typically pterosaurs fall out around about here in cladistic analysis. Richard's looming are wrapped up. <coughs> So, one of the conclusions, perhaps the most interesting conclusion we can reach is that in this respect, pterosaurs are far less convergent on birds and bats than currently thought. And indeed, there are other aspects of their biology where we also are increasingly thinking that actually they're not like birds and bats at all. So, the kind of takeaway message is um, pterosaurs perhaps even stranger and more distinct from living flyers than we thought was the case previously. Thank you very much. <laughs>